All right, well, we'll get started. Um, so the first thing I would like to remind you guys again, homework two is due on Thursday, okay? So it's now just only a little bit more than two days from now. So make sure you um, actually start working on them as soon as possible if you haven't done so. All right, <clears throat> so uh, we will again be looking into chapter one, um, temperature and heat, all right? So let's quickly take a look at what we um, learn last time. So last time we um, kind of introduced the definition in physics for temperature and the SI unit of it, it's Kelvin, okay? It's not um, the Fahrenheit, it's not Celsius. Um, there are different types of thermometers you could have, like digital ones are more often uh, used these days. Um, now, because there are different scales uh, for temperature, so it will be useful, you know how to convert from one to another, okay? So uh, for Celsius and Kelvin, um, the difference uh, in temperature is the same on um, these two scales. Uh, on Fahrenheit, it's a different scale, okay? So nine degree um, difference in Fahrenheit corresponding to five degrees in Celsius or five degrees in Kelvin, okay? Um, so, uh, we derive the equations of, um, we give an example of how to derive equation from Celsius to Fahrenheit in the class, but these are the uh, uh, equations you can use from converting from any, um, between any two of the scales, okay? All right, and then we also talk about thermal expansion. So this is um, true for most of the materials. When you heat it up, you will expand. When you um, cool it down, you will shrink. And the amount of expansion or shrink um, is proportional to the temperature change. So put that into equation, um, delta L is equal to alpha, which is the um, linear um, coefficient of linear expansion or one dimensional expansion times L naught, which means L initial, okay, times delta T, all right? So um, this week's lab, you guys are going to um, measure the alpha coefficient of linear expansion for several materials. Um, you are doing several metals, but um, this is the basically the equation you'll be using, okay? Um, now, when you get to a very low temperature, then alpha is um, temperature dependent, or in general, alpha is temperature dependent, but um, in the normal temperature range, this the dependent is not so obviously. So in normal temperature range, you usually just treat that as linear, not temperature dependent, okay? But in some region, it's more temperature dependent, then you'll be doing derivative of that to get your alpha, okay? All right. For two dimensional, um, then the expansion in area is twice of linear, uh, coefficient of linear expansion times the original area and then times change in delta t, okay? For three dimensional, it's three times of the linear coefficient of um, expansion, three alphas, which um, there's a symbol beta for it. So delta v equals to beta, beta is three times of alpha, okay? All right, so that's what we learned last time. So today we are going to talk about heat transfer. Um, so if you have um, two objects in contact, so let's say you have a can of soda and then you put it in contact with ice. So originally the two have different temperature, then um, after some time the two will reach equilibrium, they will have the same temperature. Um, um, all right, so there's something in the chat. Um, it's not quite relevant um, to the class. All right, but um, so after a certain time, um, it will, um, the two will reach equilibrium. So then the temperature of the two will be the, um, the same, okay? So uh, what happens here is um, the higher temperature object will give heat to the lower temperature object. So, and then the lower temperature object, in this case, the ice will receive the heat and that given out by the, um, the cam here, okay? So when you have two in, in contact, then there will be heat exchange between the two if they are not in the same, tem um, same temperature, okay? Um, so, um, so then heat here, the exchange of heat here, we use symbol Q, all 
All right, so this is basically energy train exchange of the two objects, okay? So Q, because it's a form of energy, so it should have a SI unit of joule, okay? So heat is also a form of energy. There are some other units you might be seeing like calorie, okay, which is equal to 4.186 joules, okay? So you might be seeing uh, different um, temp, um, units being using, and then you probably want to do the unit conversion if it's not given in SI unit in the first place. All right. <clears throat> um, so the heat is being demonstrated by James Rule um, quite some time ago, like more than 200 years ago, that, um, well, about 200 years ago something like in that range, but it's been demonstrated that heat is equivalent to mechanical energy, okay? So basically, um, James um, Duo did an experiment like this. So he has a, a container with water and then there's a stirrer here, which um, can be driven by this, the weights over here by this two pulley. And if you let go of the two weights, so you know that the mechanical energy or the gravitational potential energy will change, right? All right. Um, I was just checking the chat there as um, um, some people have an issue with their laptop, but um, so um, I guess they can always review after um, video is recorded and post on it, but um, here, when you have two weights drop down, then um, you have uh, gravitational potential energy change, which uh, when Joule monitor the temperature of the water here increases due to that, okay? So then um, this demonstrate that you can convert gravitational potential energy into the heat um, added to the water, because if you add heat to the water, then the temperature of water will increase, okay? All right, so, um, most of the time when you add heat to the water or to some um, materials, then the temperature of it will increase, okay? So then you can write the equation here. So if you have heat added, then that causes the temperature change delta T, all right? So it's being expressed by this equation, Q equals to MC delta T, where C is uh, where M the mass of the object uh, or the substance, and then C is called the specific heat capacity of the object, of the substance, okay? And C um, is in the unit of joules per kilogram times Kelvin or joules per kilogram times degree Celsius because Kelvin and degree Celsius, they are, um, the change of the temperature are the same in the two scales, okay? So those two units are equivalent to each other. Um, sometimes you may be seeing like Q equals to capital C times delta T. In that case, then the capital C means um, just the heat capacity, or let me just write it down on my um, paper here. So Q equals to C times delta T. Let me stop sharing for just a few seconds and then I will um, reshare the screen. So in this case, C is the heat capacity. It's called the heat capacity, okay? If you write Q equals to M small c delta T, then small c is the specific heat capacity. All right, so basically the two um, has a relationship of small c equals to capital C divided by M, okay? So specific heat capacity is heat capacity per unit mass, okay? Per kilogram, so um, capital C over M. So that's the relationship between the two, all right? Okay, so then let's go back to the slides here, okay? Um, now this equation um, 
it's valid most of the time if there's no phase transition. Okay, so uh, we will talk about phase and phase, phase transition in a little bit later, but um, basically like substance could have different phases like solid, um, liquid and um, gas. And then there's um, transition from one to another. When that happens, then uh, you cannot simply just consider this equation. We will, we will talk about details of that later, okay? But um, if there's no phase transition, then Q equals to MC times delta T. Okay, so which means um, heat added or taken away from the object is equal to MC times the change of temperature, okay? Um, so specific heat capacity or sometimes just called specific heat, all right, um, is substance dependent. So which means it's specified to a particular substance. So you can find the heat capacity of um, substance here. Um, and then, um, yeah, the, these are given in two um, units, joules or kilo um, calories per kilogram times two, times meters uh, times the degree Celsius. Okay, so you can look it up here. So this is under normal um, condition. All right. <clears throat> and when I say normal condition is, um, you can think like this is just, um, um, a constant number, it does change with um, respect to time, um, respect to temperature, okay? Now, when we get to very low temperature range or very high range, then um, specific heat capacity is actually temperature dependent. We we'll also talk about that um, on that uh, in a little while, okay? But um, under normal condition, it's a constant. All right. So the application of um, specific heat capacity is that um, if you can find the specific heat capacity of a certain substance, then you can actually look at up on the table and then identify what that substance is if you do not know uh, what it is initially, okay? So a device used um, to do this is called calorimeter, which is very um, uh, often used in chemistry. Um, it's a device that is very light uh, weight and it's well insulated um, a container. Some, most of the time it's a flask that contains water. And then you can dip um, the object into the water. And if you know the initial temperature of the object and then the water, so the water and the object will come to equilibrium, thermal equilibrium after some time then you can calculate what's the specific heat capacity of the substance. And then you can find, um, identify what substance is that, okay? But basically, um, two assumptions here, uh, we are going to assume that the, um, after some times later, the final temperatures of the two, the object and the water, they are equal to each other, okay? So that means um, you have the two rich thermal equilibrium. The second condition is the total energy of the system will be conserved. So that means, um, um, the heat is just being exchanged between the object and the water, okay, not to the surrounding. So in that case, then you can write Q of the cold plus Q of the hot equal to zero, okay? So typically you would have the substance, unknown sub object as the Q hot and then water as the Q cold, and then the two would add up to be zero, okay? So, and this is um, the energy conservation basically. So um, we will allow us to calculate specific heat um, of an object, okay? We will have a lab on this, but we'll take a look on one example here, all right? So this one says, if you have 225 grams of lead ball, now this time it gives you what substance it is, okay? Um, you are probably looking for the final temperature of the system here, yes. And it says original temperature is 81.2 degrees Celsius. It's placed in a light calorimeter containing 155 gram of water at 20.3 degrees Celsius. What's the final equivalent temperature of the system? Given specific heat capacity of the lead is 128 joules per kilogram times Kelvin and um, specific heat of water is 4186 joules per kilogram times Kelvin. All right. So you are going to um, use Q of lead. Okay. So I'm going to use um, uh, chemical symbol here. Lead is PB. 
plus Q of water H2O, and that's going to be equal to zero. And for each of this Q, you are going to use Q equals to MC um, delta T, all right? Delta T is always T final minus T initial for the two. And with those two equations, to start with you, um, can try to see if you can figure out that what's the final temperature, okay? And we will take a look on the solutions together in a few minutes here.
so um, let's take a look here. Um, so we can start with those two equations, but um, we can also list what we have um, given, have been given in the problem. So um, initial temperature for the lab is given as 81.2 degrees. And the initial temperature for the water is 20.3 degrees. Okay. It also, it tells us the mass of the lead is 155 grams. The mass of the water is 155 grams. Okay, it asks us what's the final temperature. All right. Um, so we are going to have to calculate Q. Um, PB and then Q H2O for water. Okay, so see um, what's that equal to. So Q PB should be equal to M PB, right? The mass of PB times C of PB times delta T of PB, which means T final minus T PB initial. Okay. For Q of water, excuse me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are the masses the same? Um, the mass of the water and the mass of the lead, they are not the same. Um, is there any reason they're both listed as 155? Uh, no, uh, it's a typo. Okay, I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah, thanks for, uh, so this is 225, 225, all right. 225 and 155. All right, so <clears throat> this is um, the mass H2O, CH2O, and then T final minus T H2O, okay, the final temperature of the two, they are the same. All right, so then you pretty much add these two expressions up to be zero according to energy conservation, okay? So one gives out heat, one should um, takes in heat, but the sum of the two should be equal to zero, okay? So MPB, CPB, TF minus TPB plus MH2O, CH2O, TF minus TH2O, that should equal to zero, okay? The only unknown here will be just the T final, all right? So this is the unknown, this is unknown. And then the rest um, quantities, they are given, all right? Um, temperatures are given, masses are given, and specific heat capacities, they are also um, given as well. So CPB is 128. Um, kilogram times Kelvin, I'm going to just change it to degrees Celsius because Kelvin and degrees Celsius are the same scale. This is 4186 for water, right? Okay, so then we'll be solving for TF, okay? You need to distribute um, this into the parentheses and then also this into the parentheses and then put the terms have TF together. Okay, a little bit of algebra here. Um, should be kind of straightforward for you guys. But TF minus MPB, CPB, TPB here, plus MH2O, CH2O, TF minus MH2O, CH2O, and then TH2O, that goes to zero, all right? Then we are going to um, just uh, put the terms with TF together and then the rest into the other side of the equation. Okay. So this guy plus that guy will become MPB CPB plus MH2O CH2O times TF, right? TF is the common factor and equals to, this two term will go to the other side of the equation. So minus will become positive, MPB, CPB, TPB, 
plus MH2O, CH2O, TH2O, okay? Then you'll divide both sides by this, all right? MPB, CPB plus MH2O, CH2O. So MPB, CPB plus MH2O, CH2O, okay? And that way you get rid of um, this turn in front of TF, okay? Now you can plug in your numbers to solve for your TF, okay? Um, so TF equals two. On the top here, MPB is 225 grams, all right? CPB is 4186 joules over kilograms times degree Celsius. TPB is 81.2 degrees Celsius. Okay, plus the 150, or actually it's 128 here for the CPB, 128 plus the mass of water, 155 grams, 4186 joules over kilograms degrees Celsius times 20.3 degrees Celsius, all right? Original temperature of water divided by <clears throat> MPB will be 225 grams times 128 joules over kg degrees Celsius plus 155 grams of water times 4186 joules of over kg degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, so one thing I would like to point out is here, the masses they are given in grams, okay? You could convert them into kilograms um, to be the SI unit, or you could keep it because each of the turns on the de denominator, this is grams, okay? Grams, grams, grams there, okay? So um, they are the same gram, uh, units of grams. So you don't necessarily have to convert because you pretty much you multiply mo multiply each term by 10 to the minus three to get to kilogram, right? So that will cancel out, all right? So you don't have to do that, okay? On this one. So yeah, after you plug everything into your calculator, this should give you 22 point. 888 about that so 22.8.9 degrees celsius okay roughly just to keep three digits it's 22.8 um 22.8 point 0.9 okay all right questions you guys might have yeah mute yourself and then um um speak up okay All right, now also in this case, you um, you don't have to convert um, degrees Celsius into Kelvin as Kelvin is the SI unit, right? But because that's because when you start with the, the Q for each of them here and here, you do Delta T. When you do Delta T, you don't have to convert uh, from Celsius to Kelvin, right? Because Delta T, the change in temperature in Celsius and change in temperature in Kelvin, they are the same. Okay, just, just keeping that in mind, all right? Okay. So if you guys are clear on this one, we can move on, all right? So um, as I mentioned, um, sometimes the specific heat capacity depends on temperature. Okay, so in that case, then um, again, you are starting with this equation over here. So this is just um, um, different like expression, like when you start with Q equals to MC delta T, right? Then you rearrange the term. So then C will be equal to Q over M times delta T, all right? In this case, because this is temperature dependence, we can say change in heat, okay? Or this is just um, equivalent to like heat added or 
taken out. So that's changing here, okay? So uh, we are replacing um, the, the delta with derivatives sine d, okay? And then we will give you temperature dependence of the key capacity, okay? It should be one over m dq over dt, all right? Temperature derivatives of the q. Okay, so on that one, um, we will take a look on this exercise, this exercise example here, a very low temperature, a very, very low temperature, the specific heat of a material is given by, so specific heat equals to A, it's a parameter which is equal to 0 0.0108 joules per kilogram times Kelvin square, um, so it's equal to A times T plus B times T to the Q where B is equal to 7.62 times 10 to the minus four joules over kilogram um, times K to the fourth. It says how much heat is required to heat one um, kilogram of copper from 1.00 to 3.00 Kelvin. So this is the very um, low temperature, all right? It's asking you how much heat, what's Q? So in this time, um, you will be using like one o or C equals to one over M dQ over dT, all right? You are looking for Q, so then you will be writing this in this fashion. Rearrange the term here, so dQ, is equal to C times M times DT, all right? And then you're looking for Q, it gives you the range of temperature from one carbon to three carbon, so you'll be doing integration, okay? You'll be integrating from T equal to one, zero, zero carbon to 3.00 zero carbon to get that Q, okay? So Q is equal to, integration of dq and that's equal to integration of from one kil one kelvin to three kelvin cm times dt okay m is given as one kilogram and then c is given in the formula there with the two parameters given okay so i will give you guys um again a few uh, minutes you can work on this and then once you have your answer you can click on here some your answer here on your end okay
All right, so let's take a look here. Um, so as I mentioned, Q equals to that. So then Q equals to integration from one K carbon to three carbon, okay? CM, so C, you can just um, take in the numbers given there. So C is equal to A, which is um, 0 0.0108 joules over um, kilogram times K to the square times T, okay? And then class B, which is 7.62 times 10 to the minus four joules over kilogram times K to the fourth. Okay, this is B times T to the third power and D of T, okay? So then um, T, when you do integration, T will become T square, okay, with one half, and then times this A 0 0.0108 joules over kilogram times K square, <clears throat> plus T to the third will become T to the fourth, but with one over four in front, 7.62 times 10 to the minus four joules over kilogram times Kelvin to the fourth, okay? The units there. Um, and then you are integrating from 1.00 Kelvin. So 1.00 Kelvin to 3.00 Kelvin. And in the case, Q is equal to that. So this is the lower limit, that's the upper limit, okay? So you are going to plug in upper limits into the expression and then minus um, plugging the um, lower limits into the expression will be your Q. So Q is equal to one half of 0 0.0108 joules over kilogram. Um, yeah, I, I'm missing the mass. The mass is one kilogram, okay, but um, that's fine. So everything, um, the mass can go in front there. Um, so mass can go in front, mass is one kilogram, okay, um, after you, down all this, you are going to multiply it by one kilogram, 1 1.00 kilogram of the mass, okay? So which I'm going to just put at the end, or uh, 1.00 kilogram in front, that's fine. Um, times T square, 3.0 Kelvin square, okay? Minus, you can do it this way, 1.00 Kelvin square. Okay, first over here. So that means you need a, a big bracket there. Plus one over four. All right, 7.62 kilogram times Kelvin to the fourth. Now 3.00 Kelvin to the fourth minus 1.00 Kelvin to the fourth. Here and then a big parenthesis after that. Okay, so we can take a look on the units here. So kilogram, we will cancel our kilogram here and then here. Okay, so carbon square here, we will cancel out the carbon here square and then carbon here square. Okay, um, carbon to the fourth over here, we will cancel out the carbon over to the fourth here and then here as well. Okay, so the final answer will be in just in jewels. Okay, that's consistent with um, because this is a Q, uh, this is Q that means energy, heat. Okay, so that's consistent there. So Q then equals to, um, so you want to be careful plugging all these numbers into calculators. Okay, um, but at the end, if you do everything correct, this would be 0 0.0584 jewels. Okay, so that's the heat needed um, for increasing temperature from one carbon to three carbon on the copper. Okay. And um, so I see the responses you guys submitted are all correct over here. So good job on that guys. Um, any questions you guys might have? All right.
so if you guys are clear, we are going to move on to the next um, section here in this chapter. So um, this is about phase change. Okay, so we know that substance will have different phases under different conditions, uh, primarily like pressure and temperature. Um, so for example, water, um, the three common known phases for water are ice, uh, which means solid, I, solid water. Sounds like weird, but um, yeah, solid form of H two O maybe in that phase in that in that form, and then uh, liquid water. Okay, so um, will be liquid, and then the steam, which will be vapor. So um, solid, liquid, and vapor, three phases for water. Okay, um, that those are the common. Um, commonly no phases for water, but for water, it's actually a pretty um, strange um, substance. It has more than three phases, okay? Um, but those are the three um, common ones. Now, if you have two phases in equilibrium, for example, if you have a container here, um, let's say this is just water, okay? The liquid, um, we'll say just water. And if you put water into a container where the above, uh, above the water, is, you have vacuum initially, then um, some water will evaporate, okay? And there will be an equilibrium between uh, evaporation process and condensation process. Because what happens here is some water will evaporate, so you'll have vapor on the top here but some of the vapor will condense, become water, okay? So you will reach an equilibrium between the two. So then in this case, the two will coexist, okay? Um, the equilibrium pressure here for the vapor is called equilibrium vapor pressure, okay? All right, and when you have that vapor pressure, when you have the two phases um, coexistent, so there's a process of going in both way, in the vaporization and condensation way, okay? Now, when we are cooking something, when we boil your water, when that happens, so when the water is boiling, then um, water and vapor, um, they are in equilibrium uh, status, okay? So in that case, vapor, the pressure at that point is called the vapor pressure, okay, of water boiling. So um, the vapor pressure, because typically this will be an open um, scenario. So then the vapor pressure is equivalent to the surrounding, which is called the atmospheric pressure, okay? So depending on what's the uh, atomic pressure um, that you are at, so then the vapor pressure of a water will be different. So if you are at sea level, then the atomic pressure is one ATM or one atmosphere pressure, which is slightly above 100,000 Pascal, okay? So at that, time, at that pressure, the water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, okay? If the pressure, the surrounding pressure changes, for example, at a mountain top where the atomic pressure um, decrease or the pressure of the air decreases, okay? So then the boiling temperature also decreases, okay? So for example, at Denver, it's called the um, like mile high city. So it's one mile above the sea level. So the, the air pressure there is lower. So that means the boiling temperature of water there is lower, okay? So if you, if it takes three minutes to cook an egg, then in Denver, it will take a long time, longer time, okay? And then if you go like mountain um, climbing, if you go um, higher and higher mountain, your cooking time should increase as well, okay? On the other hand, if you have a pressure cook where the vapor pressure can be uh, very high or two times of ATM, then the boiling temperature will increase. So like 120 degree roughly. In that case, um, you don't need like as long time to cook, right? So time of cooking will reduce. All right. Um, if you have a plot of pressure versus 
temperature, this is a they call a phase diagram. So in that case, you can see um, what phase is. So um, the red line here are called um, phase boundaries. Okay, so you can see on um, the very left hand side here, this is a solid when water will be under the condition here in this region will be in solid and in this region will be in liquid form and in this region will be in vapor form. Okay, so this is a phase diagram of water. The real uh, water phase diagram is rather complicated than this one. Okay, so, but this one tells us uh, the three phases of water under what condition, okay? All right, now let's talk about phase transition. When you have one uh, phase that is going to another phase, okay? So for water, um, if you look at here, the graph, uh, the graph over here, so the horizontal axis there means the heat you added in, okay? So how much heat you add in. And then the vertical axis here is the temperature of the water. So if you start from some minus um, like sub zero degrees in Celsius, then water is in ice form, okay? So if you add, add heat into the ice, the temperature of ice will rise up but it was still in solid form of ice. Then it will reach to zero degrees Celsius over here. At that point, if you keep adding heat into it, all right, then the temperature of your ice is not changing, but the form of ice is coming, becoming like partly water, partly ice. Okay, you have water ice mixture which the temperature will be remaining. So in this process, you are having phase transition. All right. After you add enough of heat, then all ice will melt into water. Now, after that, if you keep adding heat into the water, then the temperature of water will increase. Okay. Until you reach 100 degrees Celsius where the um, water is boiling. So now you will start to have phase transition of water um, into vapor form. So you will have mixture of water and steam. If you keep heating the water, then water will become all become steam, okay? And then after that, if you keep adding heat into the system, the temperature of the steam will increase, okay? So in that case, you can see that when you have phase transition, then the temperature no longer changes, even if I'm adding or taking out heat, okay? Now the reverse process is the same here. If you take out heat, okay? Say if you start from steam here, start to take out heat or cool it down, then the temperature will not change if it's having phase transition on the reverse uh, direction from steam to water. Also the same thing here from water to ice. If water freezes into ice, then the temperature stays at zero degrees Celsius, okay? The amount of heat that is required to have um, phase transition for a substance is called um, latent heat, okay? We use symbol L. So during phase transition, latent heat is equal to either you add it or take it out, okay? So if you are having melting process, you are adding heat into the system. Then the heat added is equal to the mass of the ice times the L, the latent heat, or called the fusion process. If it's melting, it's called fusion process. Um, and then, uh, or melting and freezing is called fusion. And then vaporization or condensation is called um, um, LV, latent heat of vaporization, okay? Now, the amount of heat needed um, for melting um, ice, that's the same amount of heat that can be uh, taken out from the freezing process, okay? So the reverse process and forward process, they require the same um, heat amount, but just one process, you add heat, the other process, you take out heat, okay? All right. So um, also for latent heat um, for different materials, they are um, specific to the material, okay? So if you know, or if you are looking for the latent heat for a certain process or for a certain material, you can look it up in this table, okay? All right. Fundamentally, the reason that um, 
you need latent heat is because when you go uh, from one phase to another phase, all right? So for example, uh, from solid to liquid on the top here. So from solid to liquid, in solid, the molecules are conf more confined in um, the like the um, geographical um, or geometrically sites, okay? So they are confined, more confined than the liquid. So liquid and molecular can move more freely. So in order to go from solid to liquid, you have to break our bondings over here. So that means you want to add, add energy here to break out the bondings, all right? So then um, you add heat, add energy here to break out. On the reverse process, then you need to take out heat so that the molecular can be more confined in the, um, in the sites here, okay? Um, and then also from liquid to gas, um, gas is more disordered than liquid. Um, that means the gas molecule can move more freely than liquid. So then in that case, um, to go uh, from liquid to gas, you need to add energy into there to um, break out the, um, the interactions between the molecules, okay? Reverse process, you, will, uh, you can take out heat or cool it down. All right. Sometimes, um, so phase transition goes from vapor to solid directly all the other way around, okay? So um, in winter, if it's cold, then you see like on your windshields, um, there's ice forming like that. So this is um, directly from vapor in the air goes into um, ice directly, okay? Or um, if you have dry ice, if you take it out um, from the reservoir, then you'll see that Dry ice is the solid form of carbon dioxide. If you take it out and then put it in air, you'll see um, vapor comes out of that, okay? So that's from solid to vapor um, directly, okay? So these are two um, processes you guys might um, be familiar with. But when that happens, this is called the heat, um, the latent heat between this uh, phase transition from solid to vapor or from vapor to solid directly is called um, heat of, um, sublimation, okay? So if you need that, um, then you can also look it up in the table. All right. Um, so I guess we will come back to the example tomorrow, okay? So um, we'll stop here and then we'll come back tomorrow on the example. All right. Any questions you guys might have before I let you go? If not, then we'll see you tomorrow. Bye, guys.